Good morning. We are glad that you're here, especially our visitors. If you are visiting with us, we're glad that you stopped by to worship with Uduwa this morning, and we pray uh, that you'll enjoy the Lord's Day worship that we have here at Uduwa. And if you would, fill out one of the cards on the back of the pew in front of you so we'll have a record of your attendance and stick around a little bit after worship so we'll have uh, time to fellowship with you, get to know you. Also, worship times, Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Bible study, Sunday morning, 10.30, worship, Sunday evening, 6 o'clock, and Wednesday Bible study at 7 p.m. So those are our times of worship in case you want to come back to worship with us. Also, if you are a family with young children, if you have need of a nursery or a facility, we have a nursery out the door, first card on your left, and the first room, I believe, there on the left, and you will find a nursery. If you need a training room, double windows right here behind the auditorium. Uh, let's remember all of those who are sick. Uh, uh, Mitzi Edward, let's remember her. Let's remember uh, Chuck Davison and the many that have been on the sick list uh, for, uh, for a time. And uh, good to see Charlotte and Melvin out this morning and any others who've been away from us. So uh, please, let's keep in mind, uh, let's remember those who are ill and those who covered our prayers. Also, let's remember those who have recently lost loved ones. We have uh, Connie Mathis uh, related to Judy, Judy Cagle. We also have uh, Keith Earl, who's the nephew of Sandra and Jim Green and the visitation will be at Poole Funeral Home, 300 Ralph Buckner Boulevard, Northeast, Cleveland, Tennessee, from 12.30 to 1.45 on the 10th of February, and then the memorial service will be at 2 p.m. The visitation will be from uh, 12.30 to 1.45. Service will be at 2 p.m. Also, let's singing and song leading speech practice will be today at uh, 4 30. so those of you participating in lads uh, to leaders uh, that will be today at 4 30. also valentine's sweethearts dinner saturday february 17th 5 p.m and it's ten dollars per person so if you would please buy today or very soon, give your uh, fee to David or Maria Sessions. That's for the Valentine's Sweethearts Dinner, and it is due real right now. <laughs> okay. All right, there's a latest day class, uh, February 10th, here at the congregation, and I encourage you to get a bulletin because I won't go through everything on here, it'll be too timely. But there is uh, uh, several other announcements uh, that we need to make uh, that, that is in the bulletin. In order of worship this morning, announcement, uh, I'm sorry, let's avoid that part. Opening prayer, Jim Green. Leading singing, Roger Gilbert. Uh, uh, Lord's Supper, Jason Parscale. And uh, reading scripture will be David Crownover. Sermon by Denny Howe. Closing prayer, Garrett Wyman. And, uh, Let's uh, start the service. Thank you. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, how great you are. You have blessed us in so many ways. And we give thanks and honor to you all the time. Father, we are so thankful for the leadership of this church, especially our elders. Give them wisdom and knowledge, and may they oversee the flock. And we thank you for the deacons, and we thank you for the members of the church. Also, Father, we thank you for the many blessings you sent our way. Father, we're mindful of the problems that we have in the Middle East, 
We ask you to be with the Christians there in the church. Protect them and may they always look to you for your help. Father, we at this time would like to ask you to be with our sick, be with our bereaved, and have the blessings upon them that you give to us daily. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And we just thank you for letting us live in, in the land that you created. You created the heavens and you created the earth and you created man. And Father, we have really messed up some of your creation. Father, be with us as we journey through the day. Forgive us our shortcomings, and may we all remember that we thank you for Christ Jesus that came, and with him he brought a plan of salvation that we may all one day, if we follow the truth, may see you in heaven. Bless us all, our Heavenly Father, and forgive us for our many shortcomings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
as we remember that which our Savior did for us on that cross, I'd like for us to look back at Psalms 22. We'll start in verse 6. As we, as we reflect and think about those things that Christ suffered for us. In verse 6, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him, let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while I am on my, on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a ra raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to, to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me, and the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet, I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. All my strength has hastened to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. As we re reflect on what our Lord and Savior has done for us, as we gather around this table, let us go to him in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly approach your throne. Dear Father, in remembrance of that great and supreme sacrifice that your Son gave so freely upon that cross. Dear Father, we ask that you be with our hearts, our minds, as we reflect back on that sacrifice Help us to partake of this bread in a manner that is pleasing unto you. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
Again, let us go to God in prayer. Dear Father, we once again humbly approach your throne. Dear Father, we are so reminded of the blood that is, has been shed for us. Dear Father, that it cleanses and washes away those sins. Dear Father, we're so thankful for your son to go upon that cross, to shed that precious blood that we might have hope of eternal life with you. And Father, we ask that you be with us as we partake of this fruit of the vine. Help us to reflect and remember that great sacrifice. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Separated apart from the Lord's Supper, we now have an opportunity to give back. In Acts 20, verses 35, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord, of our, of the Lord Jesus, that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly approach your throne. Dear Father, we are so blessed by you spiritually, those spiritual blessings that you bestow upon us daily. Dear Father, we thank you so much for the monetary blessings that you bestow upon us as well, the ability to go out and earn a living, to provide for our families. Dear Father, we are such a blessed people. Dear Father, be with our hearts as we give back cheerfully that which you have given to us. Let us do this in a manner that is pleasing unto you. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
if you're able, it's convenient, let's all stand together as we sing a song before the lesson. Scripture reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it? Oh, that was nice. Whew, that gave me chills. Isn't it great to be with the family that meets here at Udawa? Amen. It is great to see everyone out tonight. What indeed a beautiful morning it is. Especially to be able to come and praise our God. And what a, I'm telling you, if you just sit in the back all the time, every once in a while you got to come sit up in the front. Uh, especially here in with what Roger led, that last one, The Greatest Commands. Beautiful song. Whew. Just a... Uh, I can go for hours now. And trust me, I've got plenty of material this morning. Because we're going from Genesis 12 to Genesis 50. So we're good. Uh, Laura goes, what? 
It won't be that bad, I promise. I promise. But it is good to see everyone out. If you're a visitor, we're glad that you made your way to be with us. I encourage you to uh, get to know us and allow us to get to know you. A challenge that I haven't issued in some time is that I challenge our visitors to try to get out the doors with no short of five of us calling you out to get to know you. Good luck getting out. Now understand, there are some rules to this. You can't go out the side doors. You can't try to beat the 40 dash time. But you're going to have a hard time getting out before one of us tries to catch you and get to know you. That is just the family we are. So if you're looking for a fam family, a good home to be a part of, you found it. You don't need to go look anymore. We are just simply a congregation that is trying to do God's will in everything that we do. And so if you've got any questions about that, we encourage you to ask the elders, ask Eric or myself or the deacons. We'll be glad to give you uh, answers as to why we do what we do because it just comes from Scripture. That's all we try to do. I'm thankful to see Michael back with us this morning after his hospital stay, so be sure you see him. It's good to, to have him back. Let's continue to remember Chuck. Uh, from what I hear, he's improving each and every day. I remember what it's like down at Siskin. Matthew does a great job with, with that hospital down there. But by George, they're going to keep you busy. And they're gonna, their, their goal is to get you back where you need to be very quickly. And we're thankful for that. But I do ask that you remember Susan as she has been sick this weekend. Remember my dad, he now is sick. Um, so remember him, we're especially worried with him and, and the way that his health is, but, but I ask that you keep him in thoughts and prayers. Indeed, we're blessed, aren't we, though? We are. As we get into the lesson, I want you to turn over to Psalms chapter 111. So with the show of hands, show me who all has their Bible this morning. Hopefully a lot, because you're going to need it. But here's Psalms 111. I come across this in studying for the lessons today, and it really fits well, and it's a, it's a good song that I hope that you have marked that you learn. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the company of the upright, in the congregation. Aren't we here praising God in our worship this morning? Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all and all, by all who delight in them. A good question, do you delight in the, the law of the Lord? Do you delight in opening the scripture and studying? For me, as we have been walking through Genesis to Revelation, I... When I tell you I can stand up here for hours and go, I can't. Because of all the material and the meat and everything jumping off the page as we're looking to try to connect the dots to this road to redemption. But then you go on to verse 3, full of splendor and majesty in His work. And His righteousness endures forever. He has caused His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear Him. He remembers His covenant forever. Our God is a great God. He's the same yesterday, today, as He will be tomorrow. He remembers His covenant. He has shown His people the power of His works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of His hands are faithful and just. All His precepts are trustworthy. How do you know that? You open the Word of God and walk yourself through it. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to His people, and that's what we're really concerned with this morning. He has commanded His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praises endures forever. So how many of us want to be wise? We all do, right? Because the opposite of wise is being foolish. So who wants to be foolish this morning? None of us do. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of that wisdom. And in order to have a healthy fear of the Lord, what do you have to do? 
You have to open up His Word. And I've loved these lessons that we've looked at so far. For those that are just now joining us in, in these lessons, we've been walking through this grand masterpiece, this grand portrait that God has painted for us to walk through. Too many times we spend all of our time in the New Testament, rightfully so, that's where we learn to, to, to get into the body of Christ. We learn of Christ. We learn how to maintain and remain in that body. But I'm here to tell you there's so much in the Old Testament that we're missing if only you spend time in the New Testament. Because when you go digging in the Old Testament and you start connecting the dots and you start seeing this full road that God has prepared to redemption, it can help but deepen your faith. And so last week we looked at three verses of connecting the dots. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 where we were introduced to sin. Sin was introduced into the world. We know that and it wrecked the world. It separated us from God. It had its consequences. But then we look at, we looked at two gospel sermons by God. Genesis 3.15 and Genesis 12 verse 3. All to where God says, okay, there's a problem. The problem of sin that separates you from me and I'm going to provide the solution. Which was Christ. And here's how we're going to get to it. You know, but the question is now is how? How, God, are you going to get from saying that you're going to bless all the nations of the world? How are you going to get to that point to the cross of Calvary? And one thing about it, God provides everything we need to know in order to see how that was fulfilled. And so we looked at how he made Abraham three promises. Those three promises there in Genesis chapter 12 was, I will make you a great nation. That great nation will inherit the land of Canaan. And through your seed, all the families of the earth will be what? Blessed. Pointing to the cross of Calvary. Because it was only through Christ that everybody could be blessed, right? We understand that. But how do we walk through it? First, we've got to start with Abraham. Abraham covers Genesis 12 through 24. And here through 13 chapters, we see God spend on one man. Here in chapter 1 and 2, he spends the time to talk about his wonderful creation. This perfect creation that he created for us to where we could have life, abundance, ministry in his presence. But then he spends 13 chapters on one man. Do you think he's a man we should understand and know? He is. He was a good man. He played a major role in God's redemption. But here's what interesting thing about Abraham. You go to Joshua 24 verse 2. What do you find out? He came out of idolatry. So here it makes thinking of how he come out of idolatry. And here in Genesis chapter 12 where God says get up out of your land and I'll go and take you to a land I will show you. Abraham did it. He obeyed. He listened. And I'm remarkable, and I'm in awe of that. But then I think of James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled. That says, Abraham believed God. And you know the rest of it. It was counted to him as what? As righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. How many of us this morning would love to have a verse that has our name in it that follows the, what it says about Abraham. I know I do. I would love to have a verse that says, Denny believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was a friend of God. How awesome that would be. You know, but when we think of Abraham, we always talk about his preserving faith. How faithful he was to God. But let me tell you, yes, he had persevering faith. But guess what? He also had a faltering faith too. He was just a man. He was a great man, but he was just a man. You look at Genesis 12 and 20, he tells two lies. You go back to Genesis chapter 12. What the lie was, was, hey, go tell the Pharaoh that you're my sister, Sarah. His wife, you're not my wife, you're just my sister. 
Why did he do that? Because he was fearful. It was fear that drove this sin. It was fear that drove these lies. He allowed his faith to be conquered by fear. Even to the point of by lying and saying, Hey, just tell the Pharaoh that you're my sister. Here's the problem. Sarah was apparently beautiful. And so Pharaoh wanted her. So where was he going to put her? In his harem. And so Abraham was willing to let his own wife, because of fear, to be put in Pharaoh's harem. Think about that a minute. Here this great man that we talk about, let fear conquer him. But here's what is interesting. Here in chapter 12, 1 through 7, what does God do for Abraham? He gives him the promises, right? And then right after God gives him these promises, Abraham goes out and sins. Don't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Oh, what a great nugget it is. But I want you to keep that in mind. Of here God establishes His promises, establishes His covenant with, with Abraham, then He turns right around and sins very quickly after that. Then you go to seeing him and Lot. Lot is his nephew. And they grow in blessings. They grow in, in material wealth. And it gets to the point that they're, both of their parties start fighting with one another so that they have to separate. And as they separate, you have this scene where Abraham takes Lot and they look out into the distance. And he says, all right, Lot, we're going to have to, you're going to go one way, I'm going to go the other way, but I'm going to let you pick first. Did Abraham have to let Lot pick first? He didn't, he shouldn't have. Because who's the patriarch? Abraham is. But yet he turns to Lot and says, hey, I'm going to go ahead and let you pick. So here's the scene. You have green. You have desert. Which one are you going to pick? Boy, we could talk about it. Is the grass always greener on the other side? Whew. Nope. But that's what Lot did. Lot obviously chose what he thought was the better land to be a part of. Which goes in the direction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And which we'll get to them here in a minute. That leaves Abraham to the rocky desert side. But what I love about this is even though there in chapter 13, Abraham takes what we think is the lesser side. God renews his promises again with Abraham. He reminds him that through you I will bless all the families of the world. But then some time passes and we come to chapter 15. And so through those, we see Abraham rescue Lot. He gets captured. And then we see Abraham come in contact with Melchizedek. And, and I'm purposely avoiding that this morning because I will have to spend a lot of time on that one. But we're going to jump on into chapter 15. Because what you see in 15 is Abraham's anxiety starts growing. Why is his anxiety growing? He don't have a child yet. Specifically, he don't have a son. He's approaching the age of 100. It's obvious he is sitting here going, okay, Sarah has not been having kids. I have not been having kids. So tell me, God, how are you going to fulfill your promise of blessing me a great nation, this nation inheriting Canaan, and, and on top of that, that through me, all the families of the earth will be blessed. How are you going to do that? So his anxiety is starting to grow. Which I can understand as well as you can understand, right? How, many, how hard is it to be patient and wait on God sometimes? Especially in the society we live in. Everything at our fingertips. God answers prayers, but sometimes he says what? Wait. Whose time is always perfect? 
Right. God is. God's time is always perfect. But we've got to understand it's always about God and His glory and we need to remember that. But you go to chapter 15, look at 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to them, Shall your offspring be? And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So what I love is Abraham had a weak moment, but did God strengthen him? He did. But then you know what happens in chapter 16? He sins again. Here again, God reestablishes his promises. Takes him out and has a conversation. Abraham, you will have your own son as your heir. But just so you know, go outside and look at the heavens. Look at all the stars and try to number them. And did Abraham believe him? Yes. But then just a chapter over. Abraham is conquered by sin again. Because now they decide they want to try to help God. Here Sarah comes at him and goes, Hey, we still don't have a child. Maybe we need to take it in our own hands. Maybe God's wanting us to do this. And so she suggests that he take her handmaiden, Haggai. And from this union you see Ishmael born. You know, what I learned about this is we struggle to let go of control, don't we? Again, if they had just waited on God, what would have God done? He would have provided in the perfect time. But yet we don't want to relinquish control. And some of that, I think, is because we want to take some credit. Because aren't we a selfish people? We are. But we see what this union does. We see the problems that the descendants of Ishmael has with the descendants of Isaac. But then we come to chapter 17. 24 years after the start from Haran, 13 years after Ishmael's birth, God again reaffirms his promises to Abraham. The key verse here I want you to mark is verse 19. Here in verse 19, God said, No, but Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Again, of course now you have circumcision that comes into this. But again, God promises him Isaac. But I want you to jump over to Romans chapter 4. Keep your place, but let's look at Romans chapter 4. Again, Paul speaking of Abraham, we're going to begin in verse 18. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he has been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted as to righteousness. 
Listen to that. Abraham was accounted to his righteousness because he believed God. And because he believed God, what did his life reflect in that? Did his faith just stay stagnant? Did his faith just stay in one place? Or did his faith grow? Ooh, what a lesson there. In times we don't feel like we're very close to God or in times we let the world bring us down or we let sin creep into our lives where it conquers us. Are we allowing our faith to grow? Or have we gotten comfortable in our situations? Something to really ponder and think about. But going back to Genesis... You come to chapter 18, and now we have Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham is visited by God, and then they're going on to Sodom and Gomorrah to establish divine judgment on them where they're going to destroy the cities. And here you have Abraham that actually intercedes for the cities. And here you have the scene where he comes up and he goes, Now, God, I know you're a righteous God. I know you're a gracious God. What if there's 50 righteous people? Would you still destroy? God says, if there's 50, I won't. And he goes all the way down to 10. And in these cities, 10 can't be found righteous. Oh, what this shows of God's nature. Of God's character. We know over in Peter's account, is God long-suffering that everyone should come to repentance? He is. You see it here. Because here, He has established divine judgment on these cities. And going to destroy them. But He would relent that punishment if there was at least ten righteous souls. But we know the story. There wasn't. But because Lot was there, because of Abraham, they, God took Lot out with his wife and his two daughters. But we know what happens to Lot's wife. The command was, don't look back. And what does she do? She longs to be back. And so she looks and turns into a pillar of salt. But then after that, in 19, we see that Lot's daughters get fearful. They get scared because now what are they going to do about families and heirs to them? So they get Lot drunk and they have relations with him. And now all of a sudden, now you have the descendants of the Moabites and Amorites coming from that and how they would continue to be a thorn for Israel through her history. Then you go into chapter 20. And here after Abraham has talked with God, interceded with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, saw God's judgment and sins again. Let the sin of fear creep in and conquer him. And he lies the same way he did back in Genesis chapter 12. Except this time it's with Abimelech. He tells him to tell Sarah, hey, you're my sister. Don't tell him you're my wife. Abimelech takes her. Was going to take her into his bedroom, but God intervened. And he found out that she was indeed Abraham's wife. And he rebukes Abraham because of it. But here's the reality. As we get here to chapter 20. Here the greatest of men. We could talk about all the greatness of Abraham. But even of the greatest of men like him. Or the greatest of men that we look like at King David, a man after God's own heart, can't sever themselves from the problem of sin. 
It's a problem that's there. It's a problem that's always going to plague us and we needed a solution. And did God provide that? Yes, He did. But then you go to chapter 21. And finally, we have the birth of Isaac. Then you go to chapter 22. Some years later, after these things, verse 1, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he says, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Whew. Here God made you wait all this time for the promised son. And now some years later as you've watched Isaac grow up. And generally scholars believe this wasn't a young boy that he took to the mountain. But you've watched Isaac grow up and now God says, I want you to take your... And I love how God makes sure in scripture it says what? Only son. Take him to the mountain and sacrifice him. What would you do? Honestly, what would you do? That's hard. But Abraham got up early and went. Prepared everything. Was ready to do God's bidding. And he got to the point that he was getting ready to butcher Isaac. And God stops him. And then we come to verse 18. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Again, we see connections after connections after connections on a God that holds to his promises. Just as Jesus said in chapter 14 of John, If I go to prepare a place for you, do you not think I'm going to come back for you? Do we believe that? Do we believe that if we are faithful in trusting in God and obeying Him, that He will hold to His promises? Our God is a great God. And He will. But we don't have to stop there. You go to chapter 25. And we see Abraham... Died at 175. Verse 8, Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age. An old man, full of years, and was gathered to his people. And therefore he was buried with Sarah, his wife, in a cave that he had bought. In what land? The land of Canaan. Oh, the connections. I wish you would sit here all afternoon with me. But then, we move to Isaac. But before we do that, did Abraham know that God was working through him and his seed to help resolve the problem of sin? Do you think he knew? Well, you know what's great? We do know. You know how I know? Because our Lord tells us so. In John chapter 8, verse 56, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it. And was glad. Abraham believed in God. So much so that he let his burial be in the land of Canaan. Because he knew the nation would be there. But then we move on to Isaac. So the road started with Abraham. Now it's moved to to Isaac. 25 through 27 is his chapters. Abraham sends him off to get married to Rebekah. And then after 20 years, we see Jacob and Esau come on the scene. We know very quickly, after Esau loses his birthright, we see that he is really a profane person that we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16. And the reason for that is is how he viewed the implications of his birthright of something of no value. Over a bowl of stew, he gave up his birthright. 
But we see God show affirmation and promises to Abraham, to Isaac. Go over to chapter 26. We're going to look at verses 3 and 4. Show, sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Do you think Isaac remembered on the mountain when Abraham was getting ready to sacrifice him? Oh yeah, I'm sure it's there. I'm sure him and his dad had conversations about it. Or it was one of those things, we're just not going to talk about it. That you were willing to slice me up. And you didn't hesitate. But he would have understood Abraham's faithfulness to God. But here God reaffirms the covenant that he made with Abraham. But what's interesting here, guess what happens right after this? Isaac does the same thing that his father did. Lies. This is the pattern. We saw it with Noah in Genesis chapter 9. We saw it with Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, and now we're seeing it with Isaac. We get a promise, and then Scripture return, returns the favor in showing their own sin. But Isaac kind of fades into the background because then we go into Jacob. Abraham was a doozy, I know. But then we move into Jacob, chapter 30, 27 through 35. And so he becomes the focal point of Scripture as Isaac fades into the background. Now I want you to take your mind back over to chapter 25, verse 23. God tells Rebekah when she's having Jacob and Esau of how Esau would, would serve Jacob. And then we see the deception that her and Jacob do in getting the birthright. Now we're seeing it again with the blessing. But here's the thing. Why didn't Rebekah just wait on the Lord that we see in Psalms 27, verse 14? Again, we see somebody that feels like they have to try to have some control in the situation. That here, hey, God said that Esau was going to serve you, Jacob. But let's push this along, shall we? We get impatient instead of waiting on God. But now we see Jacob get the blessing too. So from Esau's perspective, Jacob robbed him of his birthright and his blessing. Therefore, what should happen to Jacob? He should die. So Rebekah sends him off to Haran to find a wife. And here we have the scene in chapter 28 where God appears to him and reaffirms the promises made to Abraham here in verses 12 and following. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord God stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you and all your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And what was this place called? Bethel. Here God reaffirms his blessings with Jacob now. And then we go on in chapter 29, Jacob goes and meets Laban. In which he falls in love with Rachel. And Laban cons him into working seven years to have Rachel. But then what does Laban do? He throws a twist on it. Jacob gets a taste of his own medicine. And Laban gives him Leah instead of Rachel. And then after that he goes, well, Jacob, you can work another seven years if you want. And I'll give you Rachel then. And so that's what he does. And then he ends up with Rachel. And these unions give him... Twelve sons and a daughter. But then I want you to go to chapter 35. Again, look at what God does. As you're turning there, we could talk about his meeting with Jacob and, or with, with Esau, how he was fearful there. But that's not really the point that I'm wanting you to get this morning. 
But verse 11, And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. So again, now you're combining, reconnecting the present with the past and looking forward to something better, which would be what? Which would be Christ. Then you go into chapter 37 through 50 and we look at Joseph, in which we're not going to do that this morning. You're welcome. <laughs> but I invite you to come back tonight because we are going to dive into Joseph tonight. Joseph is one of my favorite characters and so I want to spend a little bit more time with him. But the last one we've got to talk about is Judah. Because does the seed run through Joseph? No, it does not. It runs through Judah. And so that's where you come into chapter 38. And chapter 38 is a unique chapter because it's a picture of a family tragedy. And again, showing the problem of sin. And the, there's only going to be one solution to it with Christ. But we see Judah buries, like Esau, a daughter of Canaan. He has three sons and this produces death. This produces deception, harlotry, and adultery. All from this one chapter. But we've got to remember, why does the seed run through Judah though? Judah wasn't the firstborn of Jacob. So we've got to backtrack and understand why. Go back to Genesis chapter 35 verse 22. We find that Reuben, the oldest that the, the seed should have run through, because he was the eldest, commits adultery with one of his father's concubines. So it takes him out. Then you look at Simeon and Levi that you see back in 34 with the killing of the defenseless Shechemites. All because of one man that defiled their sister. And because of that they took out the whole village. So now it falls to Judah. But what I want you to gain from this chapter is what the environment of Canaan did. All through this, I hope that you were kind of seeing the environment of Canaan. Because ever since Abraham stepped foot in Canaan, has it caused problems? This is yes, this is no, let me know you're with me. I just took you through a whole bunch of chapters. That is a And why was Canaan rotten? Because of sin. And so do you think it would have been good for God's people, for Abraham and his family to stay in Canaan and grow and become a nation? Or do you think they would have been defiled by the land of Canaan and its rotting of sin? So what needed to happen? <laughs> They needed to be put in a place where they could be sheltered and almost incubated, right? That would only make sense. Ooh, hence, here comes Joseph. Don't we serve a great God? We just walked through Genesis. Of course, tonight, Lord willing, we will look at Joseph. But this is everything God weaving this road to get us to redemption. But the thing that we need to understand is that there is a problem of sin. No matter how great you think you are, no matter how good of a person you think you are, are you still going to have the problem of sin? Yes. Do you need that redemption? Yes. And that redemption is only through Him that we get the forgiveness of sins through His blood. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. So the question is, have you taken hold of that redemption? There's only one way to do that. Romans 6 makes it clear we have to go through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. If you've not done that, then you haven't contacted the blood of Christ. You haven't been clothed with Christ in baptism that we see in Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. Therefore, you are not in the body of Christ, but you can be. 
You can be. God has laid it out there. Jesus is knocking at the door. The only problem is there's not a handle on Jesus' side. You have to be the one to take the step. Why was it counted to righteousness for Abraham? Because he did what? He believed. And what did that belief look like? He trusted and obeyed. Just as the song we sing, trust and obey, for there's no other way. We have seen that all through Genesis, just in that one book. And guess what you're going to see the rest of the way through Revelation? There truly is no other way but through Christ. Are you living that life for Christ? If you're not a Christian, I encourage you to become one. Yes, it requires sacrifice. Yes, it requires to give your whole entire being to God and say, I will serve you and only you. We have to relinquish the control. Are you willing to do that? For those of us that have, have you had problems <laughs> keeping that control to God? Or have you tried to pull back and keep some of the things in your own hands? That's not going to bring God glory. What's going to bring God glory is you laying it at God's feet saying, I know you're my shelter. You're my protector. You're my comforter. Here's, here it is. I will do what you need me to do. How are you doing? It? We're here to serve you and love you in any way possible. If you need anything, get your life right with God. First and foremost, but if you need prayers, if you're struggling, we want to pray for you. So let us know. Let us be able to love you and serve you as together we stand with sin. What will you do with Jesus? The question comes to you. And you must give an answer for something you must do. sing the first and third verses. 410, 1 and 3. It's good to see everybody out this morning. Danny, appreciate that wonderful lesson.
All loving Father, we're so very thankful for the opportunity you've afforded us to gather together today on the first day of the week with folks who want to worship you. I pray that our worship this morning was um, encouraging to each other and uplifting, as well as right in your eyes, Father. Pray that everything we do today and the rest of our lives, every day of our lives, is done to glorify you. We thank you so much for those who work and during the service and to support the congregation. We thank you so much for the mission work that this congregation supports, and I pray that we have good faith in that and the leadership as we move forward. Father, once again, we're so thankful for the opportunity to meet here uh, without the fear of persecution like brothers and sisters overseas. I pray that we do what we can to support them in prayer, and that we look forward to the next appointed time to gather together, Father, as we depart. We ask all these things in accordance to your will. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs> 